It's a good Ag AM in Kansas morning. Good morning. Let's take a look and see what's coming up today. First, Jim Butler with the Kansas Geological Survey at KU shares his recent findings about the future of the Ogallala Aquifer. Next, we hear from producers about different water technologies and then from Governor Sam Brownback about conserving and extending the life of the Ogallala. Then learn about new technologies to ensure crop production in an increasingly variable environment. And we'll end with a look at the cattle that cattle feeders want. Stay with us. Closed captioning brought to you by Ag Promo Source. Together we grow. Learn more at agpromosource.com. This segment brought to you by Kansas Regenerative Medicine. Your stem cells, your health, your life. I'm Jim Butler with the Kansas Geological Survey at KU. And it's a pleasure to be out here in western Kansas today, uh, traveling with the governor to try to uh, show folks some of the results that we've kind of our fi recent findings about uh, what the future could hold for the Ogallala Aquifer here in western Kansas. And what we've been able to do at the survey is develop a new approach for analyzing aquifer data that is tailor-made for conditions here in western Kansas. And what we particularly are looking at are data that we have concerning water use or how much is pumped and how much the water level changes in our aquifer uh, each year. And uh, it's no exaggeration to say that Kansas has the best, if not some of the best, if not the best, uh, water data in the United States, if not the world. Well, a couple of years back, we got into this business because folks were asking us, okay, the, uh, the water levels in the Ogallala Aquifer are declining at a distressingly high rates. What can we do to moderate the rate of decline, and is there any possibility of stabilizing water levels in western Kansas? And so we came up with this approach to get at how much the water use, annual water use, needs to be reduced to make a significant impact on the water level decline rate out here. And the result, and what we showed this morning in northwest Kansas, is that uh, on average, uh, water use uh, decreases, annual water use decreases on the order of 25% you know, over uh, the average annual use in the previous decade can have a very significant impact. And it looks to us that in northwest Kansas, that such a level of water use reduction, 25% or so, uh, could lead to stable water levels, at least for the next uh, one to two decades. The data that we rely on are data collected at, uh, on farms. I mean, that uh, water use data is from those totalizing flow meters that each farmer has. And it's great that we have that data source here in Kansas. In Kansas, something like 99% of all non-domestic pumping wells have totalizing flow meters. Those uh, amounts are reported annually, and we can utilize that data to get insights into the aquifer's future that virtually no one else has. And just to give you an idea, Kansas, we got 99% of our wells are metered. The U.S. average is about 28%. So we're well above the average, and as I said, that gives us uh, a huge advantage, and we're able to exploit that at the KGS to be able to tell folks just what will be the impact of water use reductions. And we can say it with a fair degree of confidence because we have the data to back it up. Soil is the life of a farm, and for 25 years, SureCrop Liquid Crop Nutrition has helped growers produce abundant quality crops while preserving and improving the soils they steward. SureCrop offers complete soil and plant analysis with cropping recommendations, delivery direct to your on-farm storage, and quality crop nutrition custom blended for your field. Choose SureCrop for the assurance of excellence for your soil. Call today or visit their website for more information. There's a lot of different ways of doing this woodwork, but it's all of it still takes both hands. He had been told that uh, by the orthopedic specialist in Enid, Oklahoma, that they would have to fuse his thumb. 
And I said, no, cut it off because I didn't want it sticking up. And I found out about the Kansas regenerative stem cell and went to Manhattan. We were so impressed with how royally we were treated the first time we came to Kansas Regenerative. Well, we came in and he took out the stem cells. It took about an hour for him to process them before they put him back in my knees and my thumb. And we were out of here in about four hours and on our way back home. And I'm in here today to have my shoulders, my hips, and my back done. So I'll be able to go back to my sawmill, my shop, and do about anything I want to do. Valley Vet Supply is devoted to providing information and professional quality products at reasonable prices. Valley Vet Supply. This segment brought to you by Kansas Wheat. Learn more at rediscoverwheat.org. I'm Tom Willis, and I'm the owner of TNO Farms uh, south of Garden City. We've got 12 quarters that we have put into the uh, water, what we call the water technology farm. And we're studying different technologies. Uh, one is the mobile drip irrigation system, commonly known as the Dragon Line. Uh, we've had pretty good luck with it. Uh, we've, we have had two extremes. Last year we had a lot of rain. This year we've had no rain. And it'll be interesting to see how things go. But uh, what, we're, what we're finding uh, on one circle um, is that uh, we're not seeing a lot of difference between a 400-gallon uh, dragon line and a 600-gallon nozzle when it comes to uh, uh, saturation into the soil and uh, down to the root zone. So we're very optimistic with what we've seen there with it. We're also uh, testing a lot of moisture probes out this year. Uh, we did that last year as well, but we probably have double that amount on the farm this year and really trying to get a reading for uh, when, we knew, when we do need to water and when we don't, as well as continuing the telemetry that we have inside the wells, looking down inside the wells to say, okay, what are they doing when we pump uh, fast or when we pump slow, trying to uh, find that optimum speed. We have slowed up uh, three, three wells uh, by between 100 and 150 gallons per minute. Not because they were going dry, but just simply because we wanted to slow them up. And, and at least at this juncture, and I have to emphasize that, on, on July 16th, we haven't seen uh, any difference uh, from when we ran them uh, 100 to 150 gallons more. Our family bought this feed yard in 1997. We're in uh, just west of Hoxie, Kansas, in northwest Kansas, and we, uh, um, we have capacity to hold 60,000 cattle here. After a recent expansion we just did, um, we have about 50,000 in here right now, but we'll, uh, we're just like most commercial feedlots in Kansas. Um, we feed most of our own animals. Um, we do feed some customer cattle too, though we have some great customers that work with us. But in general, we, uh, we're buying corn from uh, local producers. Almost all the corn we use is raised right here in this county where we're at. And we're feeding cattle, making beef. That's what we're doing. Well, we farm in the northwest part of the county and, and a couple of the adjoining counties. And uh, we raise corn, milo, wheat. Uh, we run a few cows. And I think, I think what really kind of stemmed this whole thing for me anyway is the fact that that water was developed by my grandfather as, along with other, other people in that generation. It's passed to my dad. It's passed to me. And I think it's my obligation to conserve it uh, not only from a responsibility standpoint, but also to pass it on to future generations, because uh, that's just that's just what we should do, and it's the right thing to do. Where we started, where we came. I mean, early uh, winter 2015, looked at a tech farm. 2016, we started that tech farm, kept implementing technology. 2016, we had a huge amount of rain over the farm. Just not a, I mean, it's great rain, but uh, for data for what we we're trying to do, it just didn't. It wasn't obtainable, our goals. Um, this year, we've had a, a couple of hail storms and some rain events, but with the probes, we're actually doing a great job of actually keeping the, keeping the pivots off. Um, we've, uh, we've had surface water available, and uh, so we're able to actually rotate from pivot to pivot. We've got five Ogallala wells shut off. Because of that, we're very fortunate for the surface water. We don't have it all the time. We have it sometimes, so it's... It's not the most dependable source, but we can sure budget it when we have it. The, what we couldn't see before was what was going underneath the soil. 
Uh, actually, our, our probes are going quite deep since we're not running the wells, but the plant doesn't need it. So actually, hopefully, versus the circles that didn't get any hail events on it, uh, we're looking at, a, at them actually getting the nitrogen, getting the phosphate that we put down. In the prior years, even some of the, the most efficient pivots we had were probably too efficient because we didn't have the probes monitoring to the water penetration. It was actually pushing the nitrogen away from the plant. Uh, my main operation is actually corn seed sales, and uh, I do some consulting uh, with that seed sales on a lot of irrigated acres in Wichita County and some of the surrounding counties, and uh, just a small amount of uh, farming on top of that. And so uh, I'm tied to it in, in many facets. I use water for irrigation on my farm, and I consult and sell seed uh, to a lot of irrigated producers, and so uh, really irrigation is just a large part of my by operation, and that's why it's important to me that we uh, have irrigation used in the future. Next time you see a beautiful field of corn, reach out and thank the farmers who work tirelessly to raise corn for livestock feed, renewable fuels, and exports to feed a growing world population. The farmers on the Kansas Corn Commission work for Kansas Corn with grower-funded checkoff dollars that support foreign and domestic market development, research, promotion, and education to expand opportunities for Kansas farmers. To learn more, visit kscorn.com. Ag Promo Source is a unique group of marketing specialists with one mission, help your ag business grow. Each affiliate has their own area of expertise and they work together to bring you advice, products, and services. To get started, visit agpromosource.com. Ag Promo Source, together we grow. KFRM is one of the largest farm radio stations in the nation, dedicated to informing and entertaining rural listeners from northern Oklahoma to southwestern Nebraska. You can catch KFRM in many ways, of course, 550 on the AM dial, streaming at KFRM.com, or on your smartphone by going to the TuneIn Radio app, or on Ag AM in Kansas on Tuesdays, and Facebook every day of the week. KFRM, tune us in. You'll be glad you did. Grain sorghum is one of the most important cereal crops worldwide, and Kansas leads the nation in its production. Over the years, sorghum has been either exported, used in animal feed domestically, or for other industrial uses. Recently, its use in the ethanol market has seen tremendous growth, with 30% of domestic sorghum typically going to ethanol production. Kansas Grain Sorghum is committed to sorghum research, market development, and education. Learn more at ksgrainsorghum.org. This segment brought to you by SureCrop. Liquid Crop Nutrition delivered right to your farm. I uh, traveled to western Kansas today, Hoxie, Garden City, uh, really putting forward a new vision for the Ogallala Aquifer. We've talked previously about conserving and extending it, but now we have data and we've got the numbers to be able to say over a majority of it, probably two-thirds of the Ogallala, we can get to sustainable yield and still use the aquifer to produce our crops. And that's something that nobody thought was possible in the, in the past. They said, if you're going to get to sustainable use of the Ogallala, you can't irrigate. Turns out you can. We're going to have to reduce the use of water in a number of areas, in some places pretty significantly. Uh, but in this area, in uh, uh, Kearney and Finney County, region we talked about here today, 28% reduction, doing that over years period of time, because there'll be some years you're going to need more water than other years, but the years you don't need water, don't pump it. Several farmers in our area, including myself, and we got talking about uh, that we need to conserve our water because that's our long-term resource to grow feed and, and uh, really make a living out here. It, a lot of it is related to the Olala Aquifer. So, we went together to form a, what is now called a Lima. Uh, we had some special um, legislation, ended up getting passed with the help of Governor Brownback and several others. We actually developed a water conservation plan that fits our county, and it's, it's a, it's, it has some steps in it. We actually start out with a 29% reduction, and then that, that increases after every seven years. Uh, we're allowed to bank water forward, and it gives us some flexibility that will allow us to take advantage of really nice moist years like we're having now and move that water into drier years and still yet conserve uh, a really nice amount of water for our community. 
on the lemas um, and the, the proposed Kearney Finney Lima. Right now, our, our next uh, steering group committee meeting is August 21st at the GMD3. Anyone can attend, it's open to anyone around the area. Right now, we're looking at three different equations. There's a flat, a sliding, and another way to, to get to a 15% reduction. Those are the kind of what the committee come up. We've got some survey questions. We're getting some feedback on that. I, I don't know exactly where we're at on the survey, but that's where we stand today. Main thing I see is we're trying to uh, ask people to conserve water today uh, so that we have water to use in the future. And uh, that's all a voluntary effort. But uh, if we use a little less now, there'll be a little more to use later. And I plan on living around there for uh, quite a while still and, and would like to have water to drink, and I think a lot of other people would. Uh, we need water for our industries, irrigation and, and cattle and hogs and things like that too. And so uh, that's really what we're doing is conserving our water today uh, so that we have it to use in the future. I think if you look around the globe, you know, 1% of the water is usable. 1%. And uh, we have a very, or in our proposed KFL, we're the only place like it in the state of Kansas. We have surface water. We have not, and like I said, it's not all year long, but we do have surface water. To get to sustainability, we're at 28%. We're looking at a 15% reduction on this proposed Lima. If we can get that done, it's going to give an opportunity for new technology to even increase. We're looking at higher yields from, from different corn seed companies, that corns that are going to generate more yield with less water, less nitrogen. We've got to create that opportunity. We have to leave that opportunity for our future generations. So I really applaud those, uh, those leaders that have stepped up uh, and have done it themselves and proven that you can still irrigate and we can get to sustainable yield. The Kansas Wheat Innovation Center in Manhattan is rediscovering ways to get improved varieties and new genetics in the hands of farmers faster. Grower-led and checkoff-funded research initiatives are bringing about positive change. This grassroots leadership provides a strong voice in Topeka and Washington, D.C. Now is the time to partner with Kansas Wheat in moving wheat forward. Kansas Wheat Commission and Kansas Association of Wheat Growers, farmers investing in their future and yours. Log on to rediscoverwheat.org. This is Eric Stone Street, and as many of you know, I love my home state of Kansas. In March, Kansas ranchers lost homes, equipment, and thousands of cattle from the largest wildfires in the state's history. Imagine losing all you have in a fire. Not just your house, but your livelihood. Ranchers are beginning to rebuild, but it will take years and tens of millions of dollars to build back herds, fences, and other infrastructure. Today, I'm asking you to help. Donate what you can and show your support to the ranchers of Kansas. Simply go to kansasfires.com. Your donation is tax deductible and will go to those who need it the most. This segment brought to you by Kansas Corn. Learn more at kscorn.com. Uh, we have developed technology for targeted resequencing of uh, coding regions uh, of, the, of the entire genome. And we have used this technology called uh, targeted sequence capture for resequencing uh, entire uh, gene coding regions of wild MR wheat and domesticated MR wheat. Uh, the material I'm standing in front of right here, and you can see some darker heads throughout the plot here, uh, is derived from wild relatives of wheat. Uh, in this case, uh, it is containing wild alleles on all three genomes of wheat. Wheat is a hexaploid species, so it has three full sets of chromosomes, uh, each really originating from an original grass species. Uh, and we wanna go back into that pool to be able to find new genes to help us develop better wheat varieties for Kansas uh, that have better disease resistance, better drought tolerance, better heat tolerance. 
And so this is a project that we've been working on uh, for a few years and trying to start to transfer these genes into adapted material. There's already some evidence that there are genes here for drought tolerance. I have a student who's been doing some screening uh, for heat tolerance out of these materials and there's some that have very good tolerance to high temperatures. When we start talking about dealing with climate change, highly variable climate, having the ability to deal with all these stresses is really important. We know from some previous work uh, at other places that there's some resistance to fusarium head blight, there's been resistance genes to, uh, to stripe rust that have been transferred out of the wild emmer. So there are a lot of different things there. We've done some preliminary screening. We've identified some lines that potentially have uh, wheat streak resistance. Uh, so there's a lot of different value there and it really goes beyond just the commercial production side of it. We think there's a lot of potential value there also for consumers. The wild emmers will go up to an excess of 30% protein. Uh, so there's high protein. We also know that the wild emmer has about twice, the, you can find some that have about twice the antioxidant capacity that the domesticated durum has. And the durum wheat is what the domesticated form of emmer is. Uh, so we know there's high antioxidant capacity. We know that they accumulate things like iron and zinc at a much higher level. So we can start to talk about nutritionally superior wheat varieties that can come out of this material. So we think that there's real value there uh, as, as well as for our consumers, as well as helping to ensure production in an increasingly variable environment. Tarwater Farm and Home has been family owned and operated since its beginning in 1978. What you need for farm and agriculture, lawn and garden, clothing and footwear, and so much more. You'll be surprised at what you'll find in this huge store. They have what you need and lots of it. So come take a look. You'll discover that customer service is first and foremost. Always has been with the Tarwaters. Tarwater Farm and Home, 4107 North Topeka Boulevard. As fourth generation farmers themselves, Heinen Brothers Ag Service understands the risk and rewards of farming. So when it comes to quality aerial and ground application, fertilizer, ag chemicals, and anhydrous ammonia, call Heinen Brothers Ag today, 800 760 4964. Hello friends, I'm Ernie Rodina. And I'm Don Dawson with the Better Horses Radio Show. For over nine years, we've been bringing the Better Horses Radio Show to markets all across the Midwest. We talk about God, lots about horses. We talk about cows, we talk about horse health, we talk to top trainers, and we even talk about Roy Rogers. We're having a blast with Better Horses Radio Show and would love to take it to a market near you. So visit our website at betterhorsesradio.com and let us or your local radio station know you'd like to hear it in your area. The Better Horses Radio Show is unbelievable. unbelievable. This segment brought to you by Kansas Soybean Commission. Progress powered by Kansas farmers. From 2014 to 2016, feeder calf prices fell dramatically. At auction, known Angus cattle fared better than most. That's according to the biennial Here's the Premium auction market study. It shows that uh, the reputation that Angus has built up over all of this time and starting before that of course as dependable functional cattle that gain and grade uh, has, has held up and that when the market begins to fall or there's this hard dramatic crash like there was, the Angus cattle hold their value better just as they were producing higher premiums on the way up, they hold their value better and don't fall as hard when the whole market is coming down. The price for all feeder cattle in the study fell 56% in two years, compared to the known Angus cattle, which only lost 32% of their value. Angus cattle have shown a premium in each of the 22 surveys since 1999. In this study, we're, we're talking about cattle that are known to be Angus, but we don't know for sure if those Angus cattle flat work or if they were steers, how they'll gain in a feedlot. This is just on the overall reputation of Angus cattle that this premium persists and in general has grown uh, over these 17 years. So that's a testament to the reputation of the Angus breed. Now when you do have special knowledge of a set of cattle and a repeat buyer situation, then that premium will be outside of this average. Some examples in the 11 participating sale barns nationwide were still topping the market at $10 to $14 per hundredweight beyond their competition. We've also had to say a few times when we're talking about the study that, in a sense, this is the average Angus premium. And if you want to add more value than the average, 
You just have to make sure that your Angus cattle are above average and no breed out there has better tools to fulfill that goal, to make sure that your cattle are not only Angus, but among the best Angus in your area. For more information, visit cabpartners.com. I'm Clint Mefford. Closed captioning brought to you by Ag Promo Source. Together we grow. Learn more at agpromosource.com.